today with Tom and Ian, a one martini lunch. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am joined once again today by Tom for another episode in our Black Powder Service Rifle series. What is this thing? Well, this is a martini, uh, specifically a Mark IV. Okay. Uh, it is very popularly known through its service in the British Army. Absolutely. Uh, now, this is going to be a little different from some of our other rifles in that it's got a Big, chunky cartridge. That is true. It uses the 577-450, which is a 480 grain bullet, okay. over 85 grains of black powder. It's a substantial amount. Yep. And it's based on a big chunk in case. Correct. That they just neck down. Right. The 577. Uh, originally developed for the Snyder. They then necked it down to make it for Martini. So the Snyder was the British conversion of the musket into a new modern breech-loading rifle. And it was 577 straight case, because it had been a used, it was a conversion for 58 caliber muzzle loaders. Right. And so the British, they, unlike the Americans, realized that that was not ideal. So they adopted a true made from scratch breech loader, the Martini. The Martini Henry, specifically a the combination. The body Martini Henry Whitworth, if you <laughs> want to get super technical. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fundamentally, they took the action uh, designed by a Swiss guy named Von Martini, heavily inspired by the Peabody, but without an external hand. And they combined it with the barrel rifling system from Henry. Right. So, uh, now the Mark IV. What's the, what's the Mark IV? All right, well, the Mark IV started life as part of a trial in 1881, where they realized that the big, chunky bullet was not ideal. They wanted something a little better. So they said they were going to start making these 402 caliber rifles, and so they started designing how do we update the Martini. And they originally came up with all these cool ideas, like a little hopper feed on the side and a little, all sorts of cool, you know, gadgets, before realizing that was not practical. And they sort of trimmed it down to create the Mark IV design. However, before they were fully able to get that into production and field the 402, the French came up with something called 8mm Lebel, and Sorry, the yeah. British realized, okay, we're going to need a small bore smokeless cartridge. Do we really want to field the 577450, the 402 cartridge, and there soon to be a small bore smokeless, all at the same time, reserve units left and right. They thought that is impractical, and they converted pretty much all of their 402 down to back to 450. The standard. Oh shoot, go back, but yes. Like, the main troops are getting the end fields now, the bolt action lees, and so we need something for the militia and volunteer units. Let's take those 402 martinis, and just convert them back to the old cartridge, which then turns out to be wildly more expensive than anyone expected. It's a, a cavalcade of errors, essentially. Uh, but eventually these things end up being sent off to troops in India, and they, they did see field service. Exactly. This rifle actually, in particular, started off life as one of those early models with all the bells and whistles before being converted back. Uh, but because it had so many bells and whistles, they basically had to replace everything on it. It's just a conversion. All you have to do is get a new receiver and a new barrel. <laughs> but then after conversion, it was actually sent as foreign aid to Nepal, where they used it, set it into a castle where it sat for a hundred years before being recovered. If you want to learn more about that, there's a wonderful little DVD documentary, Treasures Where You Find It, which yep. details how they found these in the castle in Nepal before bringing them back where people like me could find them. IMA, International Military Antiques, had a, bought a massive cache of Nepalese arms that includes all sorts of cool stuff like this. All right, well, shall we get started with some shooting? Let's go. Big old long lever to give you plenty of leverage for when the gun gets dirty. And we just drop around in there, close the lever. Holy cow, hold on. Pith helmet sort of interferes with the sight picture. All right, pull the lever down and we get not the most vigorous ejection ever. So I, I kind of like this. That's pretty easy. That bottlenecked case, really, I've just got to push it all the way in. That bottlenecked case makes it a little bit easier to guide the round into the chamber. And that's actually got a light trigger in it. Lighter than I was expecting. Um, all of this gear is not conducive to shooting this thing well. This massively heavy, heavy leather bracing 
uh, combined with this weirdly shaped stupid helmet. <laughs> Here, you do some shooting with that. All right, let's see if you can hit anything better than I can. Right, I'm, so, I'm 0 for 2 so far. All right, so one thing, the long lever, it actually developed, they decided to go with the long lever due to problems with their ammunition when they were having in their colonies, like in the Sudan. Uh, originally, they were a foil, a brass foil, or, and it would get stuck and they would pull it out. Uh, oh, the original yeah. early martini uh, 455 or 577 450 martini cases are bizarre looking. We'll throw up a picture of one. Look, but here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they were not the most sturdy of construction. Right. And the originals had the short lever and they couldn't get the right leverage. And so when they finally decided to upgrade, they're like, based on that, Let's give it a long, extra leverage, really pull that thing out. Whoa, center punch, nice. I have shot this at a couple of matches. <laughs> you are running that thing like a professional, sir. I do have plenty of experience. Very impressive. Let me try one or two more. Let's see if I can make that two more. There we go, that was a hit. And a good energetic kick to the extractor lever to get the case out. Alright, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this off our barricade. All right, <laughs> this whole gun is the most awkward one for me yet of the ones that we've done. Uh, partly because the pith helmet bounces around, but I also feel like it's it's bouncing back under recoil, and I'm I have a hard time keeping a good solid grip on it. Maybe I just need to work on. Let's try that. So if I go down here, let's... hey, that's better. I feel like the barricade hinders a little bit because I cannot. Well, not so much. I'm still having my hands slip off the grip with most of the shots, though. You give that a try. I like it. All right, so if someone wants to know the proper exact original drill for how to use a martini, yes. the place to look is British Muzzle Loaders. Rob, over at British Muzzle Loaders, has some fantastic video on all aspects of this. Yeah, on how to load the ammunition, how to run it, period drill, proper mustache maintenance, everything you need to know. Proper kit, which this is not quite. Um, all of it, that's your source. If you just want to have some fun out at the range, we've got you covered. But if you want the details, Rob over at British Muzzle Loaders. Now, we all know that one cannot fire a lever action rifle pro. That is true, I've heard that. And this is in fact a lever action rifle. Let's see if you can shoot a pro. All right, so let me go ahead and open up a packet of ammunition for this drill. Ooh, fresh paper packeted ammo. Very nice. Hit. Hit. You don't seem to be having any difficulty with that. Uh, no, it seems to be working pretty well for me. So, I definitely want to try this. This has been, it's weird, I feel like this is the mechanically best, like most efficient of the guns that we've done so far. So far. And yet, it just feels very awkward to me. I'm not sure why. But this may be part of my salvation. That's true. Because I can shoot this exactly the same left-handed as you are right-handed. Right, it is ambidextrous. Unlike everything else that we've tried so far. So I'm ditching that stupid thing. Let's see, uh... Let's see what I can do. So I'm gonna put my ammunition over on this side. Because I will be firing. 
say. Burning my hand off. off rafts. You seem to be able to hit where you're aiming at. That is fantastic. That is, in fact, the easiest of these. <laughs> There's the irony. This lever action is, in fact, the easiest of these black powder rifles we've yet had to shoot prone. It's totally ambidextrous. The lever doesn't go down far enough, or, like, this is, this action of opening the lever up, you're already caught canting it to the side a bit to kick out the case, and it's just really natural and smooth. I don't really show it that way, but fantastic. Are you ready? No, because this stupid helmet is going to make this very difficult. Are you ready now? Now I'm ready. All right, stand by. There, speedy. 29.17 seconds. I think that's pretty good. And that was with having to fumble one of them to jam it into the chamber there. Yes, that was extremely impressive. And you ended it on a clean center punch of the target. Fantastic job. I appreciate it. One thing I do want to point out is the last thing we're shooting are these speed trials. So they are gummed up. They have that gas. Yes. So we are going to experience more malfunctions on the clock than any other point in time. So that does add to it. That is true. But I think that's also fairly realistic. Exactly. Which guns can handle, like, now there's some gunk in the chamber because, yep. ooh, you fired six rounds. All right, that was the fastest run we've had on any black powder rifle thus far between the two of us. Right. 29 seconds. I had uh, 39. Uh, 48. No, sorry, I had 48. So that puts us even with my crummy run and your sort of unfair fast run, because you've shot this a lot. That is true. But that still averages out right about where we were with the Grog. Right. I mean, if you put it uh, in terms of like at the period time, you have the experienced sergeant and conscripted me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Some guy who like, oh, I'm going to take those two shillings. And yep. And it still works pretty well, no matter who's using it, whether somebody who shot it a bunch or shooting it for, you know, some of the first rounds you've had, I think you've probably shot a martini a handful of times. Only a handful. Years. Yeah, I don't have that much hands-on time with yeah. these. It's a very elegant system. It's very simple. Open lever, put in round, close lever, pull trigger. Right. There's no safety. There's no multiple steps to anything. It's really obvious where the round goes. It's a system I feel like is hard to mess up. Right. And even when it does sort of get sticky when you're trying to load the, chain, uh, load the cartridge like it happened to me and you on the clock... It lets you know, like, yeah, okay, the lever lever's not closing. There's no, like, oh, is it almost in there? It's like, nope, and then, boop, yeah, and you're ready to go. So, now, we are going to go ahead and talk about how to make the ammunition for this, which you've actually been doing a bunch of at this point. That is correct. But we can't do it here on YouTube, because YouTube will not allow us to show video on how to make ammunition. So, head on over to History of Weapons and War. We have the link down below that is our app of historical educational firearms content, a whole ton of awesome channels over there, including the guys who have all the detailed information on this, like Rob at British Muzzle Loaders. Check that out. Uh, hopefully you have enjoyed watching the shooting segment here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Whew, you know, we got through an entire video about the martini. Didn't yeah. mention Zulus once. Yeah. You just did it. Ah, shit. <laughs>